Well, good morning, church family. Um, I hope this day is just a wonderful day. Remember, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and glad in it. I'm glad to meet with you here again. We know that in our world, we're still meeting virtually, but that doesn't mean that we're not unified. It doesn't mean we're not together, and it doesn't mean that we're not family. We are. So we're grateful to be with you today. Um, let's start as we always do. We're going to take the, um, the tyranny of the urgent, the, the, the stresses of our week, or even the, the most interesting things of our week. We're going to set them outside the doors for right now. We're going to gather together, and we're going to focus on what the Lord would have for us. So we set our minds and hearts that way towards the Scripture first before we sing. And so read with me, if you would, out of John's first epistle, chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Read with me. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father, and with his son, Jesus Christ. Together this morning. (laughs) I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me darkness we Sing a little louder. 
in this time of desperation when all we know is doubt and fear there is only one foundation we believe in this broken to focus ourselves on a certain part of our Christian walk and our Christian journey. Uh, we have what we call our spiritual disciplines as a part of our life. The um, confession of the Apostles' Creed, the, uh, the prayer of the model prayer, the remembering Christ and what he's done through communion, and the focus on Scripture. In the fourth week, we always have a focus on Scripture out of Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is a psalm that strictly focuses on the power, the provision, and the benefit of God's Word. This morning we'll be in Psalm 119, verses 33 to 40. Let's read together and thank the Lord for His holy Word. Read with me if you would. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your decrees that I may follow it to the end. Give me understanding so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Fulfill your promise to your servant so that you may be feared. And take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. How I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, preserve my life. Pray with me really quick if you would. Father, we thank you for your word and for all the life it gives us, and how your word directs our actions and our songs and our life 
and our fellowship in our church. May we trust you and your holy word all our days. In Christ's name, amen. Father, it is with those words that we seek to live in our world, to say to everyone that we encounter and everyone that we know and love, behold him, behold him there, our risen lamb, our perfect spotless righteousness. He's the great unchangeable I am. He's the king of glory. And of grace. That's, that's the foundation of our lives. And it's the foundation of what we have to offer to everyone else. That Christ is, and He's King, and He'll never change. And He gave and gave and gave, and He gives and gives and gives. And He is the way, the truth, and the life. We have a king. We have an advocate, a savior, a lover of our soul, a 
our Lord, our Master, a friend in Christ. And for that, we are immeasurably grateful. Father, we pray your mercy on our fallen world that more might come to know him and be fashioned into his likeness to become like we, the sheep of his pasture, the sheep of the good shepherd. Help us this morning, Father, in your word, with your people, in your strength, for your glory. We pray this in Christ's name, our soon coming King. Amen. In our series here in 1 Peter, we're walking through this theme of staying the course. You know, at this time, I was just sharing with someone in the worship team that <laughs> over the holidays it happened, I need reading glasses now, which is fine. If I have my one glasses on, I can see you fine, but I can't see the page fine. If I have my reading glasses on, I can see the page fine, but I can't see you fine. If I get those glasses that do both, I can't walk straight. So we're just going to switch up the glasses from time to time. I've been around enough to have lived a few places. One of the places that I lived, I, it was Alabama. You may or may not know that I grew up in rural Alabama as a young boy into my college years. And it was in my college years that I moved from a rural town to Birmingham, Alabama, which is one of the big city hubs of Alabama. And there in the big city hub of Alabama is this statue. It's actually the largest cast iron statue in the world. Who would have thought? Birmingham, Alabama. And it's a statue of the Roman god Vulcan. And Vulcan was, of course, supposedly the Roman god of fire and even of fashioning through fire. Um, and therefore, in a city that was established by a steel industry, they sought to pay homage to the industry by bringing up the concept of this Roman god. Now, you may not know much about Vulcan, nor may you care <laughs> a whole lot about Vulcan, but let me just share a few details with you. Now, there is obviously Greek and Roman mythology. In the Greek mythology side, Vulcan came to be considered the manufacturer of art, arms, iron, jewelry, and so on. Now, the, the, the history of Vulcan is this, that he was the son of Jupiter, the king of the gods from the Greek side, and Juno, the queen of the gods from the Greek side. And he should have then been a very handsome baby, but he wasn't. He wasn't very attractive, so much so that his mother was horrified and tossed him off Mount Olympus to discard of him because she didn't want him. Instantly, the drama of the pantheon is met. So Vulcan fell down for a day and a night it says, through the stairs, and unfortunately one of his legs was broken, he hit the water down below, never developed properly, so Vulcan sank to the depths of the ocean where a sea nymph, Thetis, found him and took him for her own to her underwater grotto and raised him as her own son. So, uh, little known fact about Vulcan, he was lame, he had a limp, obviously because he had a leg that never formed right. The story goes on to say that Vulcan had a happy childhood with dolphins as his playmates and pearls as his toys. Late in his childhood, he found the remains of a fisherman's fire on the beach and became fascinated with the unextinguished coal, still red hot and glowing. So he took the coal and he put it in a shell and took it back into the water with him so he could learn and grow with it. On the first day after that, the story says, Vulcan stared at this fire for hours on end. On the second day, he discovered that when he made the fire hotter with wind, certain stones sweated iron, silver, and gold. We have smelting now. The story continues, on the third day, he beat the cooled metal into shapes, bracelets, chains, swords, and shields. Vulcan made a pearl-handled knives and spoons for his foster mother, and for himself, he made a silver chariot with bridles so that the seahorses could transport him quickly. He even made people out of the gold that he wished to do his bidding. Well, later, Thetis left her underwater grotto to attend a dinner party on Mount Olympus wearing the beautiful necklace of silver and sapphires that Vulcan had made her. Juno, okay, we see the story coming back around, admired the necklace and asked where she could get one. Instantly, the nymph was embarrassed because she knew where this baby came from, which made Juno suspicious. 
She finally at last discovered the truth that the baby she had once rejected had grown into the talented blacksmith. So Juno was furious and demanded that Vulcan return home, a demand that he refused. However, he did send Juno a beautifully constructed chair made of silver and gold inlaid with mother of pearl. Juno was delighted with the gift, but as soon as she sat in it, her weight triggered a hidden spring and metal bands that sprung forth and trapped her. The chair was a cleverly devised trap. It was Jupiter, her husband, who finally saved her. He promised that if Vulcan released Juno, he would give him a wife, and that wife would be none other than Venus, the goddess of love and beauty. So Vulcan agreed, he married Venus, and they went on, and so-called lived happily ever after. <laughs> this was the homage that I saw in the city that I went to college in all the time. We saw this, this, this huge 50-plus foot statue towering over on a mount there, just over a garden and a park called Vulcan Park there in Birmingham. Now, what I've just shared with you is a myth. <laughs> That's what it looks like, right? When we read of the gods of the ancient Greek culture and the ancient Roman culture, we know that they are the fulfillment of what Voltaire had said that even religious people do, that God made man in his image and then man returned the favor. What we have in the pantheon is just a bunch of great humans, right? Because if you look at the drama, they're very human. They're just great. They're just big. But it's just a myth. Everything else I have to share with you today is not a myth. And being able to distinguish between the two is one of the things that Peter drives us towards today in our series, Staying the Course. What Peter would share with us today is that God is really there, and he has really called us to his son. Now, it may seem overstated that I would say it that way, but not so much in our world today. This is not lost on our culture that God actually exists, that his son actually exists, and he's actually called us to do something. Follow him. What Jesus said to his first disciples, which was come and follow me, is what Jesus has said to all of his disciples. Follow me. We've been in First Peter, or Second Peter, excuse me, for a little while. We covered First Peter first. We remember that that particular series was helping us to see that God was involved in our life, and he was showing us how to live a life that never fades. Remember, the great passage that so many of us know that for all who believe on the Son will have life eternal and will not perish, that life eternal is a life that never goes away. We sang this morning about the great unchangeable I am, that Jesus never changes. Well, his promises never change, so the future he's given us will never change. If we are new creations in Christ Jesus, we find ourselves living a life that will never fade, but at times we behave as though we don't. So First Peter reminds us to live that life that never fades. Second Peter warns us that in trials and temptations, you will want to leave the path. Don't. Stay the course. God is being good even through persecution. God is being good even through suffering. God is giving and giving and giving. And the topography of the life lived for Christ is the hard but right path. And there will be times that that topography will seem impossible and we will be tempted to leave the path. Don't. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. And that's where we find ourselves in today's passage. So if you would, read with me out of 2 Peter verses one, or chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. 2 Peter 16 through 21. I'm not sure. Do we have the slide that I control? We don't. Oh, there it is. Wait. I'm messing with them now. Sorry about that. If you'd find that scripture slide, I would appreciate it. And we'll read together out of 2 Peter 1, 16 to 21. Read with me. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven. We were with him on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand 
that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord, and we thank God for his word. So this morning, we're trying to see that God is really there, and he has really called us to his son. What are we going to cover this morning? First, we're going to see that Peter tells us that what he's talking about is not a fairy tale. And Karl Marx called religion the opiate of the masses, right? This is what we use to try and deal with this complex and difficult world. We create religions, and we create characters in religion, and we create morality so that we can believe that there's something outside of us that we can transfer responsibility, we can transfer sovereignty to. That's possible. Sure it is. We create all kinds of unrealistic things in our world. The question is, what would corroborate or what would verify that one thing is true and one thing isn't? I've had many people over the years say to me, it sounds like you Christians are saying that everybody else is wrong but you. Allah doesn't exist. Muhammad wasn't a prophet of God. Buddha didn't represent the universe. He's not in nirvana right now. Shinto doesn't exist. That God after God after God after God after religion after religion after religion after religion is all wrong but you guys. What gives you the right to say that? That's a really good question, I think. If it's true that then there is only one right way, then every other way than that is wrong. So clearly mankind has fabricated religions and fabricated so-called truths and fabricated so-called gods. But we're claiming, for good reason, that this isn't one of those fabrications. It's not a fairy tale. Peter will say, because we saw it with our own eyes and we heard it with our own ears. And finally, it's all because in the whole process of receiving revelation and communicating and, uh, and, and giving revelation, we've never been on our own. And we'll cover that when we get there as we look at this truth that God is really there and he has really sent us and called us to his son. All right, let's look at our first section together. It starts in verse 16 where Peter says, we did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were rather eyewitnesses to his majesty. Peter says right out of the gate that this is not some sort of fairy tale because we didn't follow any cleverly devised or man-made stories, no myths. But rather, we were eyewitnesses. We saw things. We were there. We were part of it when it came. And this is a common theme in the early church. This was a common theme in the beginning of early scripture. Peter's going to say we saw things. We were there. We touched things. We were engaging it. Now, we know that one of our great premises is that we live by faith, right? You might remember the story of Thomas. This is one of my favorite stories to highlight because I think we miss it so often. Thomas, who is often called Doubting Thomas, was told that the Lord had risen from the dead, right? And what does he say? I won't believe it. I won't believe it until I can put my fingers in his wounds and I can see him with my own eyes, then I'll believe it. So we go, oh, Thomas was a doubter. Now, that's in John's Gospel, chapter 20. If you just back up a few chapters when they're getting ready to head to Bethany where Lazarus has died... And if they go there, the likelihood is it's going to lead to Jesus' death. And his disciples are saying to him, we can't go there because if we do, they're going to take you and you're going to die. At that point, what does Thomas say? Well, then let us go and die with him. (laughs) I really don't think Thomas was a doubter. Maybe you've been there before where something tragic happened and your mind knows what's true, but you're just broken hearted. Right? You You just can't deal with the cold truth at that moment. Even if it's encouraging, you're just hurting. And I think that's where Thomas was. I think Thomas followed his Lord, he loved his Lord, and and he just, he, he was devastated that he was killed on a cross. He was put to ignoble shame. He was hung and put on display, half naked for everyone to see after he was nearly beat to death. And he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He saw Jesus give and give and give and give and then watch his own people hate him for it and then kill him. So I think when, when Thomas says, until I see it, until I feel it, I won't believe, I think he was just hurting. 
So, of course, Jesus in his kindness does appear to him. He says, here, Thomas, here are my wounds. Instantly, Thomas falls. And he says, my Lord and my God. And he confesses the truth of who he is. And he's, he's, he's just overwhelmed with emotion. And Jesus says, because you see, you believe. Blessed are those who don't see and yet believe, right? All of this to get to that phrase. We live by faith. Not by sight. However, God in his kind condescension has made our faith reasonable. Living by faith doesn't mean that we just have this blind belief in something that has no reason or logic or, 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 or linear concept to it at all. We're not just picking ideas out of the sky, uh, premonitions that we have or emotions that we want to ferret after and, and turn into some religion. No, we believe Something that is beyond ourself, but on the way to our gaze to the beyond, we have proof after proof after proof after proof after proof. Reasonability after reasonability after reasonability. God has left us so much behind. This theme we see pops into Scripture all the time. John 1, 1 to 18, in that great prologue, John says, we beheld his glory. We saw him. And we saw him glorified. We were there, we saw it. In 1 Corinthians 15, as Paul is talking about the resurrection, he says, look, I delivered to you first what was given to me, that Christ rose from the dead. And then he showed himself to over 500 people. And then after those 500 brothers and sisters witnessed, he showed himself to the apostles. And even after that, he showed himself to me, one untimely born. I've seen him. I witness after I witness after I witness. John 1, 1 to 3, or 1 John 1 to 3, we, as we read this morning, that's where John, in his gospel, he says, I've written my gospel so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you have eternal life. He wrote his first epistle, I've written 1 John so that if you have believed, you may know you have eternal life. He begins that one much the same way. As he says, that which we have seen, which we have heard with our ears, and he even says, which we have handled. This concept is riddled throughout the scripture. Paul finds himself in the Areopagus in Athens in Acts 17. And they've got all these gods up there that he knows aren't true. And then there's this one, this bust to the unknown God. And whereas that is not some ancient reference to Jesus or reference to God, the, 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 the most high God, Paul employs it. And he says, I actually know who that ungod, unknown God is. And he explains to them the truth of God and the truth of the gospel and the coming of the Son of God. Because I've seen him. You guys are all talking to mute, human hand-carved statues. I've seen the one who made the stone that you carve your statues out of. I've seen the one who made you in your mother's womb. I've seen the one, as he says, in whom we live and breathe and have our being. I've seen him. I know him. Have you ever wondered in the Apostles' Creed that we confess... It all makes sense if you just read it except for one line, right? Because we're talking about what is the core of the belief of Christianity? I believe in God the Father, almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, and then suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, buried and dead, and on the third day he rose again from where he ascended to heaven, where he sits at the right hand of the Father, and from thence he will come and judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, I believe in the universal church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the life everlasting, amen. And I asked myself as a young Christian, why on earth does Pontius Pilate get to be in that list? I mean, for goodness sakes, I've got God the Father, I've got God the Son, I've got his passion, I've got his glorified resurrection, I've got the Holy Spirit, I've got the church, I've got communion, I've got the life everlasting. What in the world is Pontius Pilate doing in there? It's because it, it is a concept throughout Scripture and throughout church tradition to timestamp things. You know what they're saying? Jesus isn't a myth. He came at a certain point at a certain time in human history where there were people, and they saw him. And one of them that he suffered under was a real leader named Pontius Pilate. They're saying, folks, this happened in history. This is not a story. It's an account. This is real. 
We certainly, certainly walk by faith and not by sight. But man, he's given us so many reasons to believe, so much to see. And this really oftentimes is a question that we find ourselves being asked. What have we seen? When we think about engaging the world with the truth of the gospel, or even standing firm in our own faith, do we remember what God has shown us? Do we remember what God has done? When we read the stories in the Bible, do we see them as history, like if we were reading a history book? Or do we see them as some sort of, I don't know, that's a nice story. That's a maybe. I have seen so much of the power of God in my few years. I can't conceive, and, and i got to tell you, I, I'm a skeptic. I challenge everything. <laughs> everything. And I love being the guy who's like, wait a minute, how do we know that? Based on what? Who said that? Why did they say that? I love not just taking things apart, but knowing for sure. I've never been one to just accept the medicine because somebody decides to give it to me. I want to know what's in it. I want to know what it does. And challenge after challenge, after discipline after discipline, after person after person, I would have to give up reasonability to, divine, to, to, to deny Christianity. I don't think reality makes sense, at least to me, without it. It doesn't make sense without it. I can't put together in my mind, which my mind doesn't have to define the universe, but for me, I have to. Be, I can't put it together without him. And within him, everything makes sense. In him, everything is in line. We certainly live by faith, but he's given us a lot to see. The question is whether or not we will remember it. So at the end of the day, we confess with Peter that we know that he is and that he lives and that he is good, and that he is coming again. We know it. Just ask yourself, is that where you still are? In difficult times, or even sometimes in times of plenty, it's so easy to stray off the path. Do you know it? Do you remember what's true? That no matter the circumstance, you know it. No matter what's happening, all of the ins and outs and the ebb and flow of life that is constantly changing, your gaze is on the one who never changes, the great unchangeable I am. Do we know it? And, and if so, you will find yourself regularly saying in life, I, I don't know what's going on right now. And maybe even, I don't know why it's going on. But I can tell you where it's going. God's going to turn it into good. I can tell you what is true. I don't know what, what's going on there, but what I do know is that God is in charge and he's sovereign and he's good. We're going to be okay. Are we constantly being driven to the what we do know or are we constantly being tossed about by the what we don't know? It's an old Alabama Southern phrase. <laughs> don't let the devil take what you know for what you don't. There's a lot of things in your life you're not going to be able to explain. And some of those, it may not be your business to explain them. But the one thing we do know, the one thing we do have, the one thing that does define us is Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the maker and the lover of our souls. God is really there, and he has really called us to his son. And Peter says we know this because we've seen it with our own eyes, and we've heard it with our own ears. If I could, let me just share with you the story of what Peter is talking about. In Matthew chapter 17, Peter and the disciples are on mission with Jesus, and they're taken aside, he, and James and John, this inner circle, to experience something that absolutely divine. It says in Matthew 17, starting in verse 1, after six days, Jesus took them took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and, and, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And there he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then appeared before them Moses and Elijah walking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, 
it is good for us to be here, and if you wish, I, I will put up three shelters, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son in whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. And we cannot lose these words. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you've seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Peter, James, and John were taken to a place to see a glimpse of the unveiled glory of Christ, transfigured. This would be akin to Moses seeing the reflection of the backside of the glory of God. They're not looking right at it. If they would have been looking right at it, they would have fallen down way before they heard the voice. But when they heard the voice, they knew. The cells in their body knew. That's our creator. And they bowed down. You will find in scripture that that is the single response to anyone who finds themselves in the presence of even a manifestation of God as they fall down in fear and worship in the midst of his greatness. And this is what Peter is saying. He's saying, I was there. <laughs> like, has your, has your life ever looked like that in your Christian walk? Such that it would be impossible to talk you out of something? You couldn't have talked Peter out of this. Peter, Jesus isn't really God. I, <laughs> you can say that until the cows come home. He, he's like Captain America. I can do all this all day. I was there. I saw it. You can't unsee it. Me and James and John went up the mountain. This wasn't weird. We went places with Jesus. He did things in ways we didn't expect. So if he said, hey, I want you to go get that donkey, or hey, go down to the sea, or hey, two, two people do other this, go ask in this city that person or this. It was, it was strange sometimes. And there were things he said that we didn't understand. So when he told us to go up the mountain, that was normal. But what happened there? Peter said, it changed me forever. I saw it. But I not only saw it, I, I heard the voice. And the voice said things and we understood them. And it terrified us to our core. He saw it. Is that how our faith is? And I look, I know we might be like, well, I've never seen him transfigured. He's never taken me up a mountain. Would that have been enough? Peter's going to deny him. He's going to struggle a few days later. We all struggle. But as he looks back, he sees it. I want you to notice the allusion to the sacred mountain that they were on in the text. He's hearkening all the way back to Sinai. Do you understand that what God has been doing, he's always been doing? And the ups and downs and the ebbs and flows of history have only been just details in a single line story. Well, then on top of that, Jesus gives an impossible corroboration. Do you know that it is one of the tenets of Islam that if you are faithful, you will find yourself in the presence if you're male. If you are faithful and you go on jihad or you accomplish what Allah wants you to accomplish, you'll find yourself in heaven with 70 virgins and heaven will be great for you. I don't know if that's hell for the virgins. But that's what you get. Well, that's an awesome promise to give when no one gets to come back and say whether or not they use the coupon. You ever do that? You ever Google coupon for, and then you just find out, and then you go to the coupon websites, and people say, oh, 17 used it today, and they give the thumbs up, right? Well, when it comes to the afterlife of every other religion, there's no one to come back to give the thumbs up. It's you die, and you go, I, I guess it worked. What did Jesus say? I promise you something in heaven, and you'll know it when you get there. Nah. He did, but he also said, and when you kill me, I'm coming back. That's an impossible corroboration. That's what we would call in the risk business, you're going to fail. Because, buddy, no one comes back. Why is it that Christians are right and everybody else is wrong? Because Jesus is alive and everybody else is dead. And it doesn't make us right. It makes the one whom called us, the one to whom we're called to, right. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. We are not. 
We are just those who speak the truth that was given to us. We are those who live the truth that was handed to us. And we are those who celebrate the truth that was just afforded to us, that he gives and he gives, and we want other people to be given to. We're not trying to be right. We're trying to be sharing. We're trying to give because life was given to us. We're trying to love because love was given to us. He told him, don't say anything about this until I rise from the dead. And people of God, he rose from the dead. And you know what Peter's doing now? He's saying something. Just like his Lord told him to. It's what he's doing. I don't know if we think of it that way, that as he's writing this, this letter, as he's doing it, he's doing what the Lord told him to do. He told us when he rose from the dead, we need to let you guys know that he rose from the dead and what happened. And that's what I'm doing. And this is why we ask ourselves, you know, if, if, if Peter is saying something, what are we saying? Jesus said before he left, all authority has been given to me in the heaven and the earth. Therefore, go make disciples, baptizing and teaching. Tell people about me and help them to follow me. And just for a moment, take an accounting of your Christian walk. How much of it is engaged in one way or another in telling people who Jesus is and helping them to walk with him, to follow him? It's what he told us to do. He told Peter what you've seen. I need you to hold it until I rise from the dead. But when I rise from the dead, you can tell people then. And then he's doing it. Jesus told us, I want you to go and teach people about me. And I want you to baptize them into my blood and into my way and into new life in me. And are we doing it? Are we helping people to cope with the difficulties of this world from the perspective of the sovereignty of God? Are we teaching our young people to turn to and to know their sovereign before their days get late and there's no more joy in them, as Solomon says in Ecclesiastes? Depend on your sovereign. Are we teaching people to see reality through the lens of Scripture? Are we helping them to have the truth that the Scripture provides? What are we saying? Or are we giving cultural or generational aphorisms, calling that wisdom and wisdom alone? Do we have a way of doing things that if we really looked at it could not be founded in Scripture, and do we still keep doing it that way? Peter's saying, look, what we're sharing with you, this, this course that you need to stay, it's not a myth, and we know it because we've seen it, and we've heard it, and we've touched it, and we've lived it out, and then we've dedicated ourselves. Have you ever thought about all that was at risk and all of the cost of the growth of the church? If Jesus really was a lie or a fake or a cheat, they had nothing to gain. We have false teachers all over the place. We've got false teachers that are showing up on TV right now, casting out the demon of COVID. And they're saying, I demand COVID, you have no more power. And the next day, more people die. So clearly, they're a false prophet. They don't want the whole Bible, though, because if you're a false prophet saying, thus says the Lord, and you're wrong, Old Testament, you should be killed. We don't go there. <laughs> but they have a lot to gain. Why? If you'll just touch your TV screen now, and send in your donation, God will bless you. If you will just give that seed of giving, God will blossom that into a great forest of blessing for you. Just send the money, send the money, send the money, send the money. Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagen, Paula White, Joel Osteen are wolves peddling lies for their own benefit. And I will say this very firmly because ne'er a preacher should ever deliver God's word by selling tickets to their conference so that people can come like it's a Celine Dion concert. God is not pleased with that, and it is not the delivery of the gospel of Jesus Christ according to the right way. A good teacher is worthy of double honor, but not double, 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 $85 million house honor. See, they have a lot to gain from their lies, because in our world today, they've worked the system for money. Let's think about what the disciples had. Yes, stand up for a so-called false Jesus and lose your family, and lose your homeland. Watch brothers and sisters boiled in oil, drawn and quartered, impaled, and left by the side of the city. 
Follow Jesus and stand up for something that you know to be a lie so that you can be persecuted and driven away and sent into exile so that you can be separated and dishonored and made fun of. They had nothing to gain. Either they were out of their mind or it was so truth they were living out Peter's words. Where else can we go? I don't care if this life in you is hard. I know that it's true. And I want a true life any day over an easy, false life. He'd seen it, and he couldn't go back. Well, not only had he seen it, not only is he recognizing it's a fair, not a fairy tale, but he's also letting us know that we've never been on our own. See, we often think that it's up to us to figure out. I, I remember coming back on a plane from uh, Romania, and we had gone on a mission trip, and there was a young man with us, and he came up to me in the, in the plane, and he sat down, and he said, Rob, hey, listen, I'm talking to this guy, and we're trying to talk about things, and he's got some questions about evolution, and I don't, I don't know if I know the answer to the question, so can you give me some really good points so I can win the argument and so that I can help him? I need to convince him about Jesus. I said, little brother, <laughs> um, it's not up to us to convince anybody, because you can't. If a person is spiritually dead, they can't hear you because they're spiritually dead. Not for spiritual things, there'll be foolishness to them. And if a person is an enemy of God, they don't want to hear you. They're just being polite. If the Holy Spirit isn't involved, nothing's going to happen. Oh, well, gosh, why should I even share with him then? Huh? <laughs> it's not that we have to, it's that we get to. Are you asking me why you should have the opportunity to see the power of God work in another person's life because you love them as you've been loved? He's like, good point. <laughs> now, here's some questions to ask and here's some ways, but just get to know the person and spend some time with them. Ask them what they do believe and just chat with them. This isn't a sales pitch. We're not trying to say, what's it going to take to get you into Jesus this afternoon? We're not selling them the undercoat spray and maybe 2000 off the MSRP. We're not doing that. We know the way of life and we have compassion because compassion has been shown to us and we believe it. We're praying that God would have mercy on them and they would be able to see and believe as well. But if you're trying to convince somebody, if you're trying to do the job of the Holy Spirit, you are uh, grossly overestimating yourself. <laughs> so, go share. Go be with, you know. And, and that's, that's the nature of how it is that we have never been on our own to come to Christ or to share Christ or for other people to come to Christ. We've never been on our own. In this passage, he says there, starting in verses 19, I believe, and following, and we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you would do well to pay attention to it. As to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. This beautiful language that's employing what's going on in creation. That's employing what's going on in John 1. That's employing what's going on in Zechariah's song about how he would lead and the morning star would rise on high. That's just showing that the light and the life that we have in Christ will come and be fulfilled. But it's not going to be fulfilled through another message. It's not going to happen through another way. You need to pay attention to this light. That's the one. We are all spiritually aloft at sea and lost with nothing but water and horizon on all sides. And one lifeboat is coming. That's it. There's only one way of salvation. There's only one light to direct us. There's only one truth. And he's saying we have it made more certain because we saw it. Remember last week that Peter says, I don't know how much time I have left. But I'm going to keep telling you. As long as I can. Because he knows, with them dies the apostles. Now comes the second generation. And granted, that doesn't change the truth at all. But boy, it changes our ability to believe it. If someone says, A happened, and you ask, did you see it? No, but my mother did. Okay. Would that have been the same feeling as if they had said, yeah, I saw it? It's not. And the faithlessness and the weakness and the skepticism of the human heart begins to fade more and more and more over time. And Peter's saying, I don't have much time left. And I'm going to keep telling you. And we have this word of prophecy made more certain because we saw it. But you need to know this, above all, 
You have to understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. Why? For no prophecy ever had its origin in the will of men. But those were men who spoke from God as they were carried along or they were moved by the Holy Spirit. He's saying that their message is more reliable because you were at the source. But then Peter immediately says, and the only reason that makes the source reliable is because we weren't the only ones involved. He says, no prophecy ever had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God and were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is aligned with the great biblical confession that we have that all Scripture is inspired or God-breathed. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be equipped for every good work. Now, if I can put on my teacher hat for just a second. Let's talk about this. This is where we get the concept of biblical inspiration from. Okay? In that particular passage, there is a Greek word that Paul essentially just made up. doesn't mean that it's wrong. It's just he created a word. Okay? And it was the word theopneusta. It is a, a compound word from the word theos, which means God, and pneuma, which means wind, spirit, of breath. And so this is where we get all scripture is theopneustos. It is God-breathed. And this is where we get the concept from and the doctrine from inspired from that word. As Paul's trying to communicate to us what scripture is. Once we accept that it's inspired, what does that mean? And there are essentially four approaches to understanding how the scripture could have inspired. One of them is autographa, that God would just take over. The disciples would fall into a trance. They would wake up later and boom, there's a book in front. I have no idea how I wrote this. This is rejected outright. It's not the right view. Another one is, is that God wrote it and gave it to them and then they gave it to us. And a little bit of that happened. Maybe you can think what part of scripture God actually wrote with his own hand. Ten commandments, right? Carved them in stone, it says. So that's a little bit. Another approach is that God dictated, write this down, don't write that down. Well, we have a little bit more of that, right? We certainly see it in Revelation. We see it in some of the prophets where God speaks and they write down. There's even a, a passage in Revelation where God speaks and he says, don't write that down. <laughs> okay, so that's one of the mysteries, the things that we don't get to know. There were seven peals of thunder and John was going to write down what the seven peals of thunder said. God said, don't write that down. All right. But primarily what we have is we have human authors using their own words, communicating a truth that they've experienced and that they've had shared with them through the Holy Spirit of God, but the Holy Spirit was working with them to make sure everything they wrote was content true. And some people struggle with this. They will say, if you go down to UNC today and you take Bart Ehrman's course, he will say the Bible is just written by men. That's it. And he's only half right, but he's mostly wrong. The Bible was written by men, but they weren't on their own. It's not it. The Holy Spirit was moving them along like a rudder moves along a ship. This verb is used elsewhere in the Gospels to talk about ships and rudders and how they move. That when that rudder turns one way, the ships go in that way. And as the Holy Spirit was working with them <clears throat> in writing Scripture, he was directing them where to go so that everything they said was content true in their own words. And we know this, you can take any Greek scholar, you could cut out any phrase or sentence out of John's Gospel, any random word, and you can put it in front of a Greek scholar and they'll look at it and they'll go, oh, that's Johannes. Because the vocabulary and the sentence structure is different than Luke's writing, it's different than Peter's writing, it's different than Paul's writing. They had little nuances of saying things that was in their words. So we do have their words inspired by the Holy Spirit being held content true. What Peter is saying is that men did not provide God's message by themselves. They didn't. Neither the word spoken nor the word written. But here's one of the great encouragements. Just as it wasn't provided by man's will alone, we also do not receive God's message by ourselves. The same author that directed the writing of the scripture is the teacher who teaches us the reading of scripture. Every believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit and is guided by the one who guided the ones to write it and he guides us to read it and he guides us to understand it and then he guides us to do it. <laughs> 
my master's degree is called a Master of Divinity, <laughs> which, if you'll forgive me, I think is one of the stupidest names you could ever name a degree. Supposedly, I'm a Master of Divine Things. <laughs> You've heard me before struggle with giving children the Fruit of the Spirit Award. Never understood that. But whatever we call it, however we show the accountability of, okay, you finished a degree, you did the coursework, or we really love the way that you live, and we want to we encourage you in that. Whatever we call it, however we do it, aren't you grateful that the Holy Spirit is with us? I mean, I'm, I'm, a, little, I'm a little mouthy and a little, little dumb on some things, right? But I'm not on my own. I remember when I went to my 10-year reunion, high school reunion, before we took the meal, someone said, Robbie, because I went by Robbie's young child, will you say the prayer? And right before I said the prayer, you could hear this whisper from one girl to another, it's weird that he's praying. Because when I knew them, I was not a praying young man. And to think not only that the Lord would have mercy on me and I would come to life, but then I would become a teacher and a leader in the church. As much trouble as I caused in high school, now to be a high school teacher also, the irony is just deafening. And there should be no reason why I can do it, but God's Spirit helps me. Through the years, He's helped me to keep my mouth shut more. Through the years, He's helped me to be more patient and listen. Maybe given me wisdom to understand a few things. If I were on my own, I would just fail. But by God's mercy and in His Spirit, from time to time, it's effective because He's good. And there's so many things I don't understand. When I read the scripture, I just don't get it. And I pray. Do you pray? I ask God's Spirit, help me to understand when I read it. When I prepare a sermon, I ask God's Spirit, help me to understand and communicate it. And then I have to trust as I pray, Lord, my heart is not haughty nor my eyes lofty, nor my, neither do I concern myself with great matters or things too profound for me. Like a weaned child is with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. Every Sunday, every time I teach, I quote from Psalm 131 to remind me I have no clever wisdom or stories on my own to share. So if I feel as though when I'm trying to explain the scripture that I'm leaving the scripture and starting to explain things that interest me, I should shut my mouth and come back. Because at the end of the day, if I have a moment with you, I want to share, if I just have that moment, I want to share God's word because that's where life is. But by God's grace, I have more than a moment. And sometimes we share stories and daily life over noodles. And that's wonderful. But if I only get to say one thing to you, I just want you to know what he said. Because I want you to live. This is what Peter's doing. He says, guys, we've never been on our own. We weren't on our own when we gave it. You're not on your own when you get it. You've never been on your own. And you never will be. You're going to be tempted in life to forget that he's called us to his son. You're going to be tempted in life to wonder if he's still there. You're going to be tempted in life to wonder if he's with us. And what Peter's saying is he is. It's true. Stay the course. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I ask as we hear it and we encounter it that we would believe. That there are things in our world that are trying to blot out the written truth of your word, the coming of Christ, his life, his ministry, his miracles, his death, his resurrection. They're trying to blot out that the Son of God walked among us and loved us with a great love. There are sounds that are trying to overspeak and trying to filibuster the doctrine of Scripture, that people find their identity in God, and they find their person in God, and they find their value in God. And we're trying to say it's other things, but Father, we just pray that the symphony of the gospel would sing more true and louder, and even through us and even in our lives, that we would know that the truth of the gospel is not a myth, it's not just a story. And we would remember what we've seen, and we would trust that you're with us. We pray, Father, that you would help us to help others to see the same. I pray this in Christ's name, our soon coming King. Amen.
certainly an oldie but a goodie right there. <clears throat> I hope you know that too. Um, I hope you know um, that he loves you and that he gives you a future and that because he lives in him you can be free. Maybe you're watching today and you don't know Christ. You maybe come to church, you read the Bible or you're interested and you don't know what it means to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. You don't know what it means to believe the gospel. Oh, we'd love to share you with that today. We'd love to speak with you and talk with you and help you to just know what we know, to share with you the gift that we've been giving. If you would like to hear more about the gospel or what it means to be a believer of Jesus Christ, to be a Christian, what it means to be a child of God, please just reach out. Um, uh, go to our website, send us an email, we'll get it right away. Myself, one of the deacons, one of the lovely people in our church, we'd love to just talk to you and spend time. Maybe you're struggling and you know that he lives but you're having trouble facing tomorrow. I get that. In fact, there are many people in Scripture who are characters of the Bible who get that. It's, it's, it, it happens. And if you need some encouragement, please reach out. I, just, I know so many people in our fellowship that are just wonderful listeners and wonderful encouragers, and we want you to know the truth that you're not alone. God hasn't left you alone. He's always with you. And he hasn't left you alone on earth. You have a family in the church, and we'd love to spend time with you. So please, just reach out. Give us the gift of being able to give you
the fellowship that God has given you in us. And if you've been encouraged this morning, just thank the Lord. Remember what he's done. Remember that it's truth and continue to build your lives on it. So grateful you're with us. Let me pray and we'll close for today. Father, we thank you that not only are you the one and true king, not only are you the sovereign and mighty God, but you've told us about yourself. You've given us prophets and scripture, signs and wonders. And then Jesus, you gave us yourself. You came and you walked among us and you showed us the truth. You showed us the way and you showed us the life. And then you went and prepared a place so that we could be with you forever. You made it so that we could be one with you as you are one with the Father and with the Spirit. We can't be grateful enough. And as the voices say no, help us rather to say amen. And as the philosophies and the cultures deny, help us to say with love and gratitude even louder, amen. For we believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in your Spirit who gives us new life. Because of that, we can face any death. So we thank you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. Have a wonderful day. God bless you.